The Franklin took Australia to a new understanding of the environment as a collective national issue. Now it is climate change which challenges us Australians to take a lead in a globally collective campaign to save the whole of the Earth's living and life-supporting environment. At this National Press Club podium last year, Sir Nicholas Stern took this challenge a step further when he called for a 1% of, of gross global product to be taken and employed in tackling climate change. He forecast that if we don't act, our grandchildren will face a 6 to 20% diversion of their gross, national, uh, gross global income. It's unconscionable for us not to act, and act urgently. For those who will inherit Australia from us, we must not simply leave them to a much greater uh, problem. Yet the influential oil, coal and logging lobbies are pulling back on, the, on their reins on Canberra. Professor Ross Garner at this podium last Wednesday described global warming as a diabolical policy challenge requiring, and I quote, strong early action to avoid an indelible surrender which deliberately misses low cost options for mitigation. Yet the Garno assessment is somewhat minimalist. For example, Professor Garno pointed out that he has not assessed the massive costs of losing the Great Barrier Reef, our global icon which sustains more jobs than the whole of the Australian mining, coal mining industry put together. And uh, the, the Great Barrier Reef generates close to $6 billion in tourism revenue each year. Nor did Professor Garno assess the cost of higher mortality rates from heating cities and towns across Australia, or the costs to the environment, such as the extinction of Australian birds, mammals, reptiles, fish and plants. Already, his daunting data of a 10% chance of no flow at all in the Murray-Darling River system in future years is being overtaken by data indicating that drought is the new norm across Australia's great food, food producing bowl. Meanwhile, visiting the Coorong last weekend, Prime Minister Rudd admitted unnecessary defeat by not committing to urgently bringing water down the river to revive the Ramsar wetland and bird and fish breeding and feeding ground, another uh, here's another Australian environmental icon which is dying before our very eyes. The Swedish scientist Arrhenius first postulated global warming 112 years ago, in 1896. It has been on our national agenda for at least 40 years. Professor Ralph Slatcher, for example, of the Australian National University, warned about the impact of atmospheric pollution as far back as the 1960s. The Democrats created a Senate inquiry 20 years ago. Yet the major polluters have kept the body politic caged and ineffective. This must end. My fear is that after 11 years of culpable inaction by the Howard government, the Rudd government's action will be too tentative and ineffective. The tests are clear. First, will the government reduce emissions fast enough and deep enough to match world's best practice and so realistically address dangerous climate change. Australia should have an emissions trading scheme which aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40 per cent below 1990 levels by 2020 and by some 90 per cent by 2050. By the way, that agreement on a 50 per cent cut in a vision of a 50 per cent cut in emissions by the G8 overnight will translate into at least an 80 or 90 per cent cut for Australia by 2050 under any model of global equity. Second, will the emissions trading scheme be fair to all Australians rather than pandering to the demands of the big polluters? The debate on petrol taxes led by Brendan Nelson indicates how a political appeal to popular self-interest can so easily overrun the much greater and more profound interest of Australia and Australians in tackling the long-term pro problem of global warming. 
The Prime Minister must resist the big polluters' special interest pleadings, or the scheme will become more expensive for everyone else. There will be less money to assist ordinary Australians and less money for renewables research and development. We Greens want an emission trading scheme that actually helps to stop climate change and avoids that dangerous tipping point of two degrees in global warming. That requires a rigorous and comprehensive scheme which not only lowers Australia's 90, 1990 pollution levels by 40% by 2020, but which also turns down the growing rate of emissions, they're going up everywhere and including in this country, we need them turned down according to the scientists, the scientific uh, majority in the world by 2015, seven years away. If the Rudd government falls short of these targets, we will move, the Greens will move, to amend the legislation when it enters the Senate. That said, emissions trading is not of itself the silver bullet. We need an array of other policies, such as a mandated renewable energy target and feed-in laws, and I'll come back to those in a moment. While the worst polluters clamour for the costs about the costs of addressing climate, the Greens, like the population at large, know the enormous benefits of early action. Besides the new industries and long-term jobs that will be created in the sunrise businesses of the future, Climate change remediation generates deep satisfaction in people's hearts. They know that we are recreating our society and economy in a way that will protect the planet and its wildlife and provide a secure, happy lifestyle for future generations. Our nation needs massive investment to retrofit all 8 million Australian homes with solar hot water and insulation to provide fast, cheap and efficient public transport and bikeways, and to utilise the huge advantages of energy efficiencies, baseload, baseload solar power and geothermal power. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back here at the National Press Club, not just because the